Um, so we have already called this meeting to order and we had the roll call before we went into executive session, which we've just come out of for the purpose of pending or resolving litigation. And so now we're going to review the agenda. Is there anything that needs to be changed on this short agenda for the special meeting? I have, uh, yeah, I'm not sure where this should be, but I, I An announcement? <laughs> yeah, sort of an announcement. Okay. <laughs> the first is that I had minor knee surgery yes. today. And so I'm only staying for this part. I'm not going to stay for the long <coughs> session. Um, and um, I'm, I am on some pain medication, so if I seem <laughs> weirder than usual. <laughs> uh. um, one thing about the, okay, one, uh, when we get to uh, future agenda items, I want to say something about the date for the uh, ACE task force discussion. Okay. And um, I am not going to be here to make reports for my commissions, mm -hmm. but I do have some important things to, to report, especially from the Environmental Commission, so I was... All right, we'll just there. allow you to do that at the, um, before we get to the future agenda okay. items. Or we'll I have, could we'll write your report. I was thinking I might write something out. That would be okay too, whatever you prefer. I, I was thinking of doing that and send, well, Patty, what do you, I mean in particular about the, uh, the easement discussion with Tecumseh Land Trust. Um, I think that that can wait until you. Okay, I, I, I will write something and then it can come in. Okay. okay. All right. Um, okay, so uh, petitions and communications. Uh, Karen Renfro wrote a letter of support for Home Inc. on behalf of Council. Uh, Marsha Walgren wrote a letter um, expressing concerns about the Vernet cleanup and, they, and this will be a part of our discussion tonight um, and the runoff from Vernet that would be going through the site that we're going to be discussing tonight on the glass farm. Um, then there was a response from Tom Dietrich on behalf of the Environmental Commission um, arguing that the level, looking at the levels of contamination and arguing that they are um, well below um, levels of contamination that should cause concern. And then there were two letters um, from children, I think, at this school. And um, one letter from children at the school um, at thanking the police for contributing money for uh, Stuff at the school. <laughs> it's a little I it, it's a camp. Yeah. A camp. Okay. okay. Yeah. And oh, it's a camp. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, and also thanks from a citizen for help received from Officer Charles. Okay. So let's go turn to public hearings and legislation, and we're going to have the first reading of 2015-13. I think we can do this by title only, and then Patty can summarize. So. It's a long title only, however. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll let Melissa do the summary. Oh, right. I should have said staff. <laughs> That's okay. It's a minor staff. Okay, so this is Ordinance 2015-13, repealing old Section 1060.05 service charges, Chapter 1060, storage and collection of garbage and other wastes of Title VI, other public services, of Part 10, streets, utilities, and public services of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1060.05 service charges. Go ahead, Melissa. Basically what this is, is we had a new contract with Rumkey, and when I got a copy of the full contract, I noticed in it um, some of the charges for the miscellaneous things such as yard waste bags and um, garbage stickers. And I wasn't sure if they were in the codified ordinances, the prices of those things, um, as are the tiers. And so when I did some research and looked at the ordinance, um, I thought that those things weren't in there and they were in there. So our, um, our garbage bags are supposed to, or our yard waste bags are supposed to be $2.50. So that's just updating um, the old rate of $2, which I believe has been in place since before I got here. Yeah, um, and then the garbage stickers are listed at $1.25, and the price with Rumpke um, in the new contract, which began September 1st, went up to $1.35. 
So we're, uh, we're changing those two things so that they are in line with the actual charges from Rumkey. Uh, on the ordinance, doesn't it say $1.50? Yes, for the stickers, um, because it's going to go up again in 2017. Okay. So we just went ahead and just braced for that. I mean, we don't okay. sell a whole lot of them, so it's an extra 15 cents. Plus, that should make up for some of the undercharging that we've been doing. So. All right. Great. All right. Any questions uh, from council? Any questions from citizens? All right. Um, I guess this is an ordinance. Um, so I guess this is our first reading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I won't be opening a public hearing in any official way this time, but next time mm -hmm. we will. And you do need a, you motion. Need a motion. I do need a motion, yes. Thank so you. So moved. Second. Second. OK. Um, so I guess call the roll. All right. Sims. Yes. Housh. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Aspen. Yes. All right, we we'll move on to the next item, which is resolution 2015-32. And I forgot to look at this. Why don't you go ahead and read this? Okay. This is resolution 2015-32, authorizing the village manager to submit an application to the Ohio Public Works Commission's Clean Ohio Conservation Program for conservation for the riparian corridor located within the glass farm. Whereas the Ohio Public Works Commission, OPWC, annually solicits applications for grants for public infrastructure projects, and whereas the Environmental Commission has sought council approval for application to this grant as a means of furthering work now, <clears throat> now underway to preserve the wetland and beaver dam area now present at the glass farm, and whereas the purpose of the grant is to preserve the existing, existing wetlands with an easement to be held by Tecumseh Land Trust, and whereas the grant will provide basic amenities to educate the public and enable enjoyment of this naturalized area and remove invasive species which would be replaced with native species, and whereas required local match funding will consist of in-kind services and materials and or private donations, as well as some support from the Village Green Space Fund. Now therefore be it resolved by the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio that Section 1, the Village Manager is authorized to support Tecumseh Land Trust, TLT, in their application to District 11 of the Ohio Public Works Commission for the above described project. Section 2, proposed improvements and activities are noted as follows. Work with Tecumseh Land Trust to develop an easement for approximately seven to eight acres on the glass farm, which would be held by TLT. Develop low impact paths and or boardwalks around the wetlands to be used by the public. Install several educational kiosks about the value of wetlands, their flora and fauna. Install a bird line. Develop a pervious parking area for bikes and five to eight vehicles with access from King Street. And develop a long term maintenance plan. Section two, this resolution shall go into effect at the earliest period allowed by law. Is there a motion for this resolution? So move. Second. Okay. Um, I guess you want to. I can to it start. First? Yeah. Um, this is um, a proposal that was brought before council at the last meeting, um, so that we could apply for uh, a Clean Ohio grant to do these improvements to the wetland. And at that time, Marshall Walgren came and had some concerns about the. Uh, Vernet spill p potentially contaminating that area and creating health hazards for people who may be visiting the area as well as for the wildlife. Um, so council asked for some more research on that. They also asked for us to sample the, um, the area and we did send the samples off. However, the results are not back yet. They should be back within a couple of days. Um, we pulled samples, Brad Alt uh, pulled samples from the, uh, where it comes out under Dayton Street into the creek. He pulled them from the culvert um, up uh, in Thistle Creek, in the back of Thistle Creek, and he pulled one from actually in the wetland area and sent those off. In addition to that, Tom has done an enormous amount of research. He came to my office and looked at um, the reports that I get from um, TRC, which is the uh, company that contracted with Vernet and is, the, uh, is doing the cleanup that is being overseen by the EPA. Vicki has also contacted her person at the EPA. <clears throat> and um, I'm just going to shorten the discussion a little bit. Um, Tom, his research, um, the uh, analysis is in your packets. Um, that the levels are well below um, what the EPA has established for surface water. 
Vicky's is not in there because unfortunately I did not get it until uh, a little bit later today. You may have one at your. Yes, we do. We you just have got it. Um, yeah, you have one at your seats, um, and there's, there should be two. Did you get the second one out? Okay. Um, both of these are also indicating um, from the EPA that these levels are well below what would be considered hazardous or toxic to the, not only the animals but to people as well. And finally, I did speak today, late today, with Kevin Collini, and Kevin is uh, the point person from TRC um, who is overseeing this cleanup, and <clears throat> according to Kevin, there were initially, um, in the early days of the spill, sediment and water samples taken all the way down to the detention area. And that at that time, they showed extremely low levels of anything that could be hazardous, um, but they did continue taking those from the time of the original spill until um, sometime in the mid-2000s, and he's not sure of the exact date that they stopped, but it was somewhere in the mid-2000s, um, because the EPA no longer required them to take them because the levels were so far below what they would have considered toxic or hazardous in any way. Um, the only one that they continue to take, and I think they take it twice a year, is at the outfall where it comes out under Dayton Street but they're no longer required to do any water or sediment sampling inside that, that area that we're talking about because the EPA about 10 years ago uh, deemed that the levels were well below where they needed to be to be safe. So if you have any questions, Vicki and Tom are both here and I'm sure that they'll happily answer any questions you might have mm -hmm. about it, but at this time, from what I'm seeing and all the information that we've gathered in the last two weeks, I don't believe this is a hazard based on the information that we have before us. All right. Um, does any, any questions or comments from council? Well, um, I'm not an, I'm, I don't, I have no expertise really in this area and I will mm -hmm. defer to Vicki and Tom, but, um, what happened with the Renee spill certainly was unfortunate. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important to put it in context also that Renee was not the only company doing this at mm -hmm. that time. And unfortunately, the system that we're in, the global capitalist system, um, continues to do this sort of thing in various ways and we we are all almost all of us are participating in this system mm -hmm. anyone who drives a car anyone who buys cleaning products anyone who uses plastic I could go on and on and on we're all participating in a system that is destroying the environment and I think the Pope's encyclica um, which I have downloaded and have just started to read makes a very strong statement in this regard. So while what happened at Vernet is unfortunate, I think what, we, what, what nature has done, what nature is doing at the wetlands and what we are just wanting to support is an example of uh, what we need to be doing, mm -hmm. I think. I mean, it's just a small little thing, mm -hmm. but uh, I think that it can become a, um, a small little wonderful example of allowing nature back in and allowing it to do the kind of uh, rewilding in that little place that yeah. can be done. So. And, and, and I, do, I do appreciate Marcia bringing the concern up mm -hmm. because it, it obviously is a very big concern for her and she was, she was right to bring it up. Mm -hmm. But I just have to say that this additional information that has been gathered by various sources mm -hmm. um, seems to indicate there's not an issue. And it, it may be that we will want to continue to sample Absolutely. the sediment as well as the water and sample it as it leaves the wetlands as mm -hmm. part of this mm -hmm. project to show what impact the wetlands mm -hmm. has on water. Yeah, yeah, it's relatively inexpensive to do the sampling, so we can certainly revisit that periodically if that's what council would like to have done. 
So I guess do you guys do either of you want to say anything? Uh, I did. Well, yeah, just say something real quick. And if you could maybe, I think you've got what is your training in this area, or what's your what's your yes. training? Yes. Yeah, in? I'm an that environmental engineer. Mm -hmm. um, Could you say your name, please? Tom Dietrich, yeah. from Sorry. the Environmental Commission, and a village resident. Um, I did do a, some additional research after sending the letter, the email to Marianne, and so, and I also compiled the data. So I wasn't able to send that ahead, but I wanted to just submit it. Um, you know, for the record, okay. if you all want it. Just um, give it to Patty or, okay. or, or, or Judy. Judy. Actually, yeah. give it to Judy. Okay, I'll just say real quick, mm -hmm. it summarizes the data that's been collected at the outfall by Vernet. They do the, the semi-annual sampling, like Patty mentioned. Um, none of the values have ever been above the, the criteria, and the levels have been dropping over time, according to this data. Um, so I'll just submit this. It shows, I've got a summary at the bottom that shows the standards and the max values, the average values, and mm -hmm. all that, a little graph. And then the um, actual citation of the water quality standard from Ohio um, revised code. Great. Thank you. Tom, can I ask Thank you a question? Yes. Um, so do you understand why there was this confusion arose? I mean, from looking at all the data, I mean, is this about looking at old numbers and that's why, or, or what I, is the I do not know. Um, well, I, I have one theory, which okay. is that um, there's different standards for evaluating the water quality, mm -hmm. and um, the five micrograms per liter MCL that Marsha did cite is about drinking water standards. Mm -hmm. So she's, if, if this was, um, if we were pulling our drinking water to, for treatment out of right there, or if we were pulling, um, that was the main concern with the groundwater, mm -hmm. if people are using that for drinking water from mm -hmm. their wells, that would be exceeding the drinking water standard. Okay. Okay? For surface water and, you know, for the potential exposure, there's a different standard. And that's what the site of this. Okay. So I believe that was the sort of Thank so it's you. probably still not a good idea to drink that water. <laughs> not probably that. not. Um, <laughs> or maybe any creek water. Any creek water. No. Yeah. Or swimming pool <laughs> water. Right. Yeah. Right. There's like Lakes. bacteria. Yeah. Okay. So I, I do want to continue to work with Marcia. And, and I have, you know, I was really glad to see Patty share all the data with me. And that there are, you know, regular reports coming in. Mm -hmm. And if council would like, we can continue to provide updates on the progress. I had seen it again, milestones and that. Yeah, and I just want to say, I think that education piece is great. You know, just what you said about continuing to work with Marsha and others that are concerned, um, because I know this has been a long standing issue mm -hmm. for the community. So, yes. thank you. Good. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Anything from you, Vicki? Um, I don't really have much else to add. Okay. Thank you for the for the information you sent us. All right. Well, um, then are well, we ready? Well, I had, I had a Sorry. question yeah. as it pertains to <clears throat> the language in the easement, or what we're going. Will, will that language come later, or are we just submitting an application? The the language in the easement will come later. Um, just like it did on the project out behind us, um, what we did was we applied for the grant, and then once the grant is offered to us, then we'll come up with the language on the easement. And I'm sure it will be very similar to the language uh, that in the easement that we uh, granted on this property behind us along the creek. Okay, because, <clears throat> see, my main concern is the fact that other than these eight acres, we still have land. Yes, uh, yes. Behind it, it, it and, yeah. and, and I just want to make sure that it, it, there's no yeah. impact no. for us Correct. having access to the retention pond. Mm -hmm. Understood. Yeah, and so forth. So. Yeah. I'll make sure. Okay. okay. Anything else from council? All right. Well, I think we're ready. Oh, to... oh I do have one more mm -hmm. thing. Um, this also is contingent on the Tecumseh Land Trust board Correct. approving this grant right and they will be meeting within a week so okay we will we can send out a notice 
All right. Well, I believe I believe I had a motion and a second, correct? Mm -hmm. So uh, I am ready to um, call for a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. But I don't think there is anybody. So uh, the resolution passes. All right. And finally, amending bylaws of the Regional Planning Coordinating Commission. Just the title. Okay. This is Resolution 2015-35, amending the bylaws of the Regional Planning and Coordinating Commission of Green County, Ohio. Still move. Second. All right. Um, so I am on this commission. It, uh, they redid their, their due structure. Karen Winpro expressed some concerns because of the fee structure being um, higher for villages than she thought was appropriate because they wanted to entice these large, larger cities back in, so they're paying less per capita. Um, the dues are still relatively modest. They, we were paying about $400 a year, and now it's around 800 and change. I can't remember. A little more, a little more than 400 and a little more than 800. Not quite twice as, uh, you know, not quite uh, twice as much as we were paying, but still 800 and some a uh, year. Um, so, I, uh, I think Karen did discuss it with them mm -hmm. and ultimately came around to say I, we should, I, that she's, she was fine going forward with it. Um, and, uh, so they because, weren't willing to lower it? No, mm -hmm. I think it, it no. Okay. No, and um, the other thing that Karen did point out um, during the meeting was that um, passing this does not recommit us to being a member. That's true. Um, council can pass this and then still choose to not re-up the membership if that's what you want to do. Since we're a mem current member, we have to be consulted mm -hmm. on any bylaw Correct. Uh, modification. We could also vote against it as a statement that we think it's unfair that they're charging us 25 cents per person and other cities 10 cents per person. Mm -hmm because it, does, it also doesn't make as much difference to their bottom line. So um, so we could vote against it and still re-up our membership, probably. Yes, I believe we could. Yes, we could. Um, our new proposed two, 2016 dues would be $871.75, um, and then slightly like $11 more the next year. Um, and they had been 400 and 442, I believe. And you said the new amount was 700 and something? No, that's for adds to the population. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. yeah it's a it was something like 452. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Do we know what the rationale was for charging us two and a half times as much as? Well, I don't think they. I think they just needed to get to a number, honestly. They needed a certain amount of money to come in, and they didn't think of it so much as charging us two and a half times. They're charging us the same as they're charging townships, basically. Yeah. When I talked to Ken LeBlanc, um, essentially that's what he said. I had, a, I had a budget number that I needed to get to, um, and they, they wanted to try to entice the larger cities back to ease the burden of that entire budget on the smaller municipalities and the townships. So in order to do that, they lower, they offered them a lower per capita rate um, because they have substantially more people. And they also have like planning departments right. that are big. Now we have used them for planning in the recent past. We, you know, have moved away from that, when, especially when we had John Young and this was really his area of expertise. I don't know if staff thinks we'll be using no, them Denise anymore. Is, Denise is up and flying. Um, and we, you know, we did have the problem of the billing that we eventually resolved, but in fact that was part of the crisis that precipitated then him looking at everything, including um, due structures. So I feel just kind of ambivalent about it. I, I don't have a strong, I, I'm a membership, I'm the liaison and I don't have a strong feeling on should do here but um, I, I, I think in some ways I'm kind of leaning towards a little protest vote it doesn't really mean anything <laughs> okay um, so 
All those in favor of amending the bylaws of the regional planning? Thank you. Did you want to ask for comment? Oh, sorry. Comments from it's pretty arcane local government stuff. Are there any <laughs> comments from the uh, vast crowd of people out there? Does not look like it. Um, did I have a motion and a second on this? I did. Okay, so all those in favor of amending these bylaws of the Regional Planning and Coordinating Commission, say aye. All those opposed, <laughs> say aye. 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 Okay, <laughs> so we can send that little message to Hi, love Emma Springs. <laughs> We're so radical. Well, okay. We have to look out All right. for our cities. So yes, um, future do. agenda <laughs> items, I believe that uh, Mary Ann wanted to make a comment. Yeah. Um, at our last meeting, we had um, set two tentative dates for our work session on the ACE task force. Uh, and those dates were October 22nd and October 26th, the Thursday <coughs> and Monday. Right. Um, I think we actually ended up on the 22nd because Brian said we could not make the 26th. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Well, here's the problem. Uh -huh. The uh, Jim McKee group is having candidates night on the 22nd. Oh. And Jerry and I are candidates. Yes. Oh. Yeah, that won't work. That will not work. So well, then I think we better just put it on the 26th. I think uh, if... What day can you I will not be here on the 26th. Yeah. yeah. What about uh, what about the 28th? It's a Wednesday night. I mean, it's a little bit later than we what than what we wanted to do, but I mean, I think it, it best if all council members are able to be present. Yeah, I think it's important. Um, <laughs> the 28th and the 29th are a Wednesday and a Thursday that I don't see any other meetings. I uh, I have a meeting down in uh, Cincinnati on the 28th, but I usually get back around seven ish but it will be a little tight 29 thursday 29, the 29 is more is more open for me jerry brian Mary 29th yeah. is open for me okay. sure so we'll just move it from october 22nd to the 29th one week later okay okay mm -hmm. um We'll need to check with Karen, obviously, right. yeah. to make sure. We will an agenda plan. And I would say then that if she can't do the 29th, then the 28th is, I can make it. I mm. might just be okay. a little late. Okay. okay. Does that seem good to everybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And that's a 7 o'clock meeting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe so. so that's, usually that's what we set up for, yeah. Okay. Anything else on that? <laughs> Okay. All right. So now, um, are there any more comments on any of the uh, the future agenda items or anything else on this uh, special meeting agenda? All right. Then I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. So we will now move right into our work session. Um, and uh, Wayne, can you start? Yes. You just yeah. need to call the old work session to order. Okay. <laughs> All that stuff. All righty. Okay. All right. So, fast forward. Yes. Sims. Yes. Huff. Yes. McQueen. Oh, so, oh, you're not here. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. right. and, and Mary Ann's going to leave. We're going to take about a two-minute break for restrooms and water refills and things like that. Very short so that we can get this going as fast as possible, no later than we've already pushed it. Well, we can go ahead and get started. Um, I think we'll just dive... Oh, wait, we, I guess Brian wanted to make a couple of very quick announcements. I yeah, sure quick announcements. Um, so first of all, I wanted to mention, uh, uh, kind of highlight the Community Solutions Workshop Conference that's happening this weekend. Uh, the title, just to make sure I've got it, Climate Crisis Solutions Tools for Transition. So it's happening Friday through Sunday. Lots of great programs at Antioch College, um, and you can find it all online. And the second thing is uh, we're getting close to the Walk for a Cure quarter auction. It's on October 3rd, so I wanted to definitely suggest people come out to that. We've got 50 awesome prizes from folks all through the village, 
This is to support Patty's 60-mile, uh, three-day walk that's going to happen in November, and it's happening here in the Bryan Center. Uh, that's a Saturday from 1 to 4. Okay, great. Okay. All right, so we're going to, without any further ado, I promise, yes. Wayne Cannon from RCAP is going to present his utility rate study for us. Appreciate uh, taking time to meet with me tonight. Uh, I think everyone got a copy. Yeah. I don't know if anyone had a chance to read that. And, yeah. I did. You did? <laughs> <laughs> but I got it before everybody else. Yeah. Okay. So I skimmed through it, but okay. not, not a lot of detail. Pretty much all what I try to do is kind of a synopsis as far as the, the verbiage. I also have the spreadsheets up if you want to talk specifics about where and the numbers came from. We can do that as well. I like for it to be very, very informal. If you've got questions at any time, please stop me and we'll be with them as we go. Uh, we were kind of commissioned to do a rate study. Uh, the rate study was driven by CMOM implementation. We had done a CMOM project on the sewer a couple years ago, and the uh, pending water treatment plant expansion, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very expensive project mm -hmm. which will require quite a bit of debt. One of the primary goals of this project was to address sustainability of both the water and sewer utilities and to improve their sustainability over time. Therefore, I did the analysis with a long-term planning horizon in mind. Uh, we spent a lot of time working with, uh, with the village uh, to identify some best management practices and to budget for those. So that is included, the cost of those things is included in the analysis. Uh, water findings, the water department has been struggling, as you know, for quite a while. You have been very proactive in raising rates, however, you have not raised rates enough to stem the tide uh, as far as the rate. Uh, as a result, there's not a lot of money left in the water capital improvement fund. It, the water department is pretty much running hand to mouth. Uh, with that said, you would have needed a rate increase if you had no additional capital improvements just to keep the thing going, to keep it sustained. Part, part of that is getting rolled in, you know, those past operating history, which is going to make the numbers look a little worse than they are for the treatment plant. And there's no way to separate that out. It just kind of is what it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've done the analysis based upon zero growth. You have had a little bit of growth, and to be commended, I don't see that very often. Mm -hmm. Most of the communities that I'm working with are shrinking, not growing. Mm -hmm. uh, universally, almost everybody is selling less utility service year after year. And that's being driven by a couple of different things. It's being driven by demographics. As we're getting older, with less kids, there's more smaller unit households. And uh, less people in the house means less water and sewer. Also, we, uh, as we replace appliances, everything is more water efficient. And that increased water efficiency has been serving to reduce utility revenues. Uh, so as you, part of the reason that your rate increases haven't kept up is that you've been spent, you've been selling the less and less service. And that's just a factor of people being more conservative. Doesn't help your revenue situation. You're in the business to sell water and sewer selling less of it, you're producing less revenue. Uh, you have identified some uh, projects that needed to proceed, uh, and you're currently undertaking the uh, dead end loop project and the bottleneck elimination project. 
there's no funding in the, in available to pay those from savings, so they are a cash expenditure, uh, which means there's debt that has to be added to to the future uh, loan service or to the rates. The cost of the treatment plant, like most big projects, has continues to rise. It's now at uh, 5.3 million dollars. And that again is going to have to be pretty much a loan only type project. You've got some water loss. 15% uh, is kind of the norm as far as the acceptable maximum. Uh, yours last year was 28%, which kind of tells me that there are some issues in the distribution system that probably need some work. Leak detections, maybe even some valves that are leaking, uh, probably some bad meters. All that's going to cost a little bit of money as you move forward. Uh, you will save money because you won't produce and have to pay as much utilities if you can get ahead of the leaks, but it's going to take some capital to get ahead, to get back ahead of the curve. With those things in mind, uh, we work with the village to put together an improved preventative maintenance program. And water maintenance. Pretty much doing those items. Um, that additional amount of work amounts to about one FTE worth of work above and beyond what you currently have budgeted and staff. But these are all new items as far as additional leak detection, valve exercising, etc. Uh, there's a little bit of materials and contractors, contract costs that was budgeted in as well. That's about $70,000 that was added to the water budget on an annual ongoing basis. So that means hiring somebody now? Is that what you're saying when you said one the FTE? Yeah. It okay. basically would be if you're going one to full, yeah. be able to uh, exercise valves, to do additional directional flushing, which is the most efficient way of uh, cleaning mm -hmm. the water system. If you are going to monitor your hydrant pressures and flows on a more proactive way, that we just need to hire people. Mm -hmm. you know, kind of estimated the time there, you know, 30 minutes per valve, 30 minutes per hydrant, 15 minutes per hydrant. Mm -hmm. We price that out based upon what Patty kind of recommended as far as a, a rate. Mm -hmm. uh, from the new treatment plant, yep. you're going to have to do some proactive maintenance at the plant. Kind of had the luxury of this old plant of running to it fail because you knew it was going to be replaced. You're not going to want to do that with a new facility because that's going to greatly shorten its life. So I budgeted uh, $15,000 a year for additional maintenance at the new plant. So, you know, those are the list of things. That's how we came up with that additional $70,000. Once uh, we also talked through predictive maintenance, which predictive maintenance is I know that at some future date I'm going to have to do something. Yeah. It's not every year. And I think for you, the best example, because you, it needs to be done right now and you don't have money to do it, is we, we have tanks. Mm -hmm. you know, the tanks are to a point where they really need to be serviced. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no money. You know, that's estimated $280,000. You don't have $280,000. Right. This is to make sure that the next go around putting some money back so that you will have money to rehab those tanks. Now we're going to get 
when we talk about capital improvements, you know, in addition to the to the tent, to building the plant, you're going to need to do some capital improvements, and one of which is going to be catching up on deferred maintenance mm -hmm. having those tanks. And that's but predictive maintenance to do those predictive maintenance would take an additional $160,000 that you transfer to savings each year to kind of build up a fund so that you've got money to pay for these things. These are all items that are not going to score for low interest loans or grants. And the agencies would, have no interest in funding maintenance. And would you also explain to Wayne about the affordability factor? Yeah. Because you do have that in here in red, but I want to make sure everybody understands it. Yeah, and we'll get to that as we okay. go through. Uh, fortunately, you know, I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you, but your rates are very low. Yeah. I know people may not realize that, mm -hmm. but when you look at the big picture and a lot of the communities that I work with, your rates are very low and mm -hmm. your community is a little wealthier than some. Mm -hmm. So you kind of got two benefits there as far as being able to increase rates. Mm -hmm. uh, quick, quick question. On, on, on rehab, are we at the point where every day that we don't rehab? I think on the tanks, you're on the cups. Yeah. I don't think you had any damage out there okay. yet. Yeah. But we need to have that on a quick horizon. Right. And and um, one thing that Brad and I are going to sit down and talk about is uh, a maintenance contract on the tanks, which is actually the cheaper way to go. It, the first time it will cost us quite a bit of money, but once the company comes in and rehabs it, you actually contract with a maintenance company to do regular rehab gotcha. on the towers for a set fee. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and it it's a, a way smarter way to go than trying to to save the money. It's easier to budget. It's a set fee. It goes up every three to five years. So it's something that Brad and I will will sit down and talk about. Okay. okay. Uh, <clears throat> that's just a different way of doing it. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't change the cost that. Maybe but it little, kind of builds it in a it, little bit more, and mm -hmm. you don't lose track of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Instead of you putting it into a savings account, you are prepaying the contract mm -hmm. to do it at some future right. date. Right. Hmm. Okay. And you know, contract if you, give, if you buy something now that you won't need for ten years, yeah, they're going to give you a better price. <laughs> So that that's where it's cheaper, but it doesn't get it doesn't take it completely out of the budget. Then we've also talked about some capital improvement projects. Uh, you know, the, loop, the things that are going to be funded pretty much now is the loop completion, the bottleneck elimination, and some money to be able to buy some maintenance equipment left for the department. And it's relatively minor compared to everything else. Then the second year, you've got that big treatment plan, and you probably need to put some wells in there. I don't think it ever makes sense to drill, to have a $5 million investment unless you're sure that the raw water source is going to be adequate for the life of that plant. Mm -hmm. So I went ahead and budgeted some wells in, even though you may or may not have those on your horizons. Uh, I put some money then the following year to paint the tanks and to work a little bit on some of the troubled water lines do some leak, leak detection and to, to fix some, some obvious problems when you start to, to, to get that information. Uh, the projects that are farther out are just that, they're, they're, they're more optional. Uh, I'm kind of an advocate for when you've got 20 year old meters that you budget to replace meters. Now I realize with the amount of capital projects you've got, that probably is a lower priority. Uh, 
keep in mind that new metering technology is a lot more labor efficient. Mm -hmm. And uh, that FTE that you would need to do the additional maintenance, a lot of communities are going and buying the meters to, to avoid and using, retraining the meter reader to do those activities mm -hmm. as, a plo as opposed to hiring an, di an additional person. Mm -hmm. So the cost of labor somewhat offsets the cost of the, the improvement. Those were the factors that kind of, in addition to our budget here, drove the rates. What I did is I took a five-year budget. Uh, we identified trends and used those trends in our projections. So, you know, wages, I took an average across those years. That typical year is what I projected forward then with inflation. You have this information in your packet, so I won't go into great detail, other than the fact that I've uh, reviewed this information with your staff. I don't believe anyone in any, has any objections to any of the numbers. Mm -hmm. I then took that information, along with the improved maintenance, and came up with a budget. So our typical year, <coughs> with inflation to show an increase. I used three and a half percent inflation. Kind of we talked about that when we had our kickoff meeting, why we use that <coughs> Those budget numbers along with improved preventative maintenance, predictive maintenance, and we, we had separate line items for distribution and treatment. That's the reason why you've got those numbers split apart. They do add together to what's over here. Mm -hmm. okay. But the items in blue, I'm pulling from additional information, adding those to the typical year. Mm -hmm. Then we we'll also look at capital improvements and financing those improvements over time. I spread them out over years. I took an improvement for each particular year just to show some break. Mm -hmm. uh, you may decide to further separate that mm -hmm. to be able to phase the increase in or slower. Mm -hmm. Typically, if I would have been involved with the treatment plan at an earlier date, I would have recommended that, that you started raising rates for that treatment plan well, three or four advance. years ago. Yeah. So, if only we could go back in time. Yes, we can. <laughs> we would all like to. We can. Yeah. But I, I say that, that mm -hmm. the more you can transition things, the more customer friendly it is. Yeah, there's going to be a little sticker shock. Yeah, there's going to be a little sticker shock. It kind of is what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, you're adding an awful lot of debt very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And on a system that really had no debt. Yeah. That kind of frames uh, mm -hmm. some of the, the numbers that we've come up with. And my thought process in doing the rate study. Mm -hmm. uh, your rates right now are structured very low. And if I, what I typically do, if I go back here, I do a fixed cost analysis. And if I look at assigning a fixed variable ratio to each line item on the expenses, and to project that down through for the typical year, then I would be looking at a base rate of about $24 and charging what? Eight. Uh, the base rate typically is trying to cover your fixed cost. Mm -hmm. now, some of that is the fact that debt is a fixed cost and you're going to have a lot more debt. Mm -hmm. 
part of that, I assume, is, was your past attempts to recognize a lot of income disparities within the community mm -hmm. and to cut a break to some of the lower income, uh, lower water usage residents. With that in mind, I did not try to change the methodology in any way. I left the methodology alone, increased rates across the board by an equal amount mm -hmm. and equal to all classes. To make ends meet, and you keep talk about percentages, and I normally wouldn't, but that's kind of the way this rate study was put together. Uh, you're looking at about 30% a year for three years. To get things stabilized. Those numbers sound horrendous. Don't talk in the public. You know, focus <laughs> about focus on the cost for a typical residential user. You know, we're going from 680 to 880 to 1150 to 15 dollars are more easily related than percentages. Percentages are there for shock value. You really don't need shock value. You need for people to, to work with this very logically. And that's 680 is per 1,000, right? Yeah. And we're now moving it up. Oh, yeah. After five years, it'll be 15. Uh, is that right? Yeah. And 18. Right. Yeah. If you look at cost the way the funding agencies do. Mm -hmm. And they define a typical residential customer for 4,500 gallons. Mm -hmm. Now, 4,500 gallons for a family of five is not nearly enough. Yeah. Um, for a single household, elderly, they barely use 2,000 gallons. Right. So, you know, it depends. You know, typical is just what it sounds like. It's middle. But a typical residential customer, based upon your median household income right now, is about 0.6% of their income. Mm -hmm. Eligibility for low interest loans and grants is usually at 1.5% median household income. The lowest level, if you were applying for G CBDG money, which you have to certify that at least 51% of the population the area to be served is in poverty. You still have to charge 1% median household income. Right now, you're charging 0.6. I know nobody ever thinks that the rate is being high it's low. It's too low. <laughs> but it's been too low for too long. Mm -hmm. That's part of the rate shock. Right. And um, Wayne, I think this also might be a, an appropriate time. You, when you were here before, um, someone asked you the question, I think it was Karen, um, about the rates, the comparison study that comes out every year. I think Oakwood does it. Yeah. And it says how Yellow Springs is, is so high. But you, you explained the factors that go into that, that that weren't taken into account in that survey. So could you just reiterate those, that? Those numbers are meaningless. And the reason being is that you are financing all cost into your rates. That's not typical of a lot of communities. There are a lot of communities that have special assessments, that have tax revenue that are used to prop up, or in this case, subsidize and hold down the utility rates, uh, particularly property assessments. Mm -hmm. uh, I always use the example of Southwest Regional Water, and I don't know if anyone knows where they're located at in Butler County. Mm -hmm. It's a nonprofit uh, water system, or a regional water system in, in Butler County. They have perhaps the lowest water rates of anybody that I'm aware of in 
the reason being that they had financed essentially all debt with assessments. The average path is about $10,000 paid up front or paid on taxes. Uh, if you had $10,000 from tax revenue to subsidize your rates with, you could have very low rates too. It's really, you know, unless They're paying you know, one way or another. Yeah, unless you know, you can't compare apples and oranges and being bananas and make an analysis. And unless you have the inside knowledge of how they structure the rates, how it's being, their debt was paid and structured, uh, what age their equipment is, how much debt do they have and how it's been maintained over time. It's impossible to compare yourself to someone else. I try to tell communities the best, if you want to debate line item expenses, uh, and that's the reason I've gone to so much effort to give you line item expenses. If you want to debate those costs, that's the way to manage cost. Hold line item, each line item to the lowest level that you feel comfortable with. But don't compare yourself to your, your water rates to someone else because you really have no idea how that revenue is going to fit into your cost structure. Once rates are stabilized, I always make a recommendation for inflation. In your case, uh, with your cost structure, uh, it stabilizes with an annual rate increase of 2.25%. I would encourage you to, once you kind of move to a stabilized position, put together an automatic annual rate adjustment. Mm -hmm. That way, this amount of pain doesn't have to happen for future councils or mm -hmm. for, for future residents of the community. The maximum, the, the rate basically, for, and the third, or I've kind of got rates stabilized after in 2017. That would result in a typical residential cost of $15.82 or 1.19% median household income, which is still below the level that you would be grant and low interest loan eligible for most programs. It sounds like a horrible increase, but that's what you need, and it's below what other communities are having to charge based upon the percentage of income. Uh, you really have done a good job. I know it's hard to say that when I'm raising rates that much, it doesn't feel that way. Mm -hmm. So when you compare your situation to other communities, and that's the way to make that comparison is the percentage of medium household income. You've done a good job of managing your water system. Is there any questions there or mm. any, any thoughts as far as where I got the numbers or? You say we've done a good job, but we're still moving up. You're in hindsight, there's definitely some things we could have done better, right? It, we could have started this process about five so years ago, right. <laughs> and started, that would have been better. When you first started talking about building the plan or rehabbing the plan, That's what if, I, if I would have been involved at that point, I would have said, let's do a 10% <coughs> increase for the next three years, five years. That, and use that money, just stick it aside for that future expense. Not only would we have reduced the culture shock, rate shock a little bit, 
but we could have paid for some of these things from savings. That's water under the bridge. But even with that said, I mean, you're at 1.2% median household income, and you're going to you are going to have the tanks rehabbed, you're going to have to put a brand new plant, you're going to have two new wells, and you've got a little bit of money set back to be able to fix things that are broken out in the distribution system. That's not a bad place to be. I do. I think residents do understand that they were supportive of the idea of building a new plant, by and large, and uh, that that costs money. And so now we have to figure that, this out. But yeah, hindsight, future councils <laughs> do better. <laughs> yes. yeah. and, and that's the reason I really talk about do an automatic. I agree. Based upon inflation, once you've got everything stabilized, mm -hmm. it's a whole lot easier for customers to deal with that two and a half, three percent rate increase, and it's what at this point two point two and a quarter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Than it is to hit them. What you're going to have to do in the next three years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, so in sewer. Yeah, just one quick question. So I didn't see it in the table here, but um, I do see, you know, the recommendation is ASAP to move it up to 0.7%. What are we now in terms of the affordability index? Is that up there? 0.6. 0.6. Okay. It's right here on the tip Yeah, it's of the, the yeah. back in the left. Okay. And I, just, I was looking at a different table. Yeah, Thanks. and part of the reason for the, the lower... Um, initial one was because we already did the one right. rate increase right. that um, financed the loop and the bottleneck. Mm -hmm. so. And actually, I did have another question, Wayne. So, does af the affordability index factor in increases in wages as well? Okay. Yeah. So they're this, both they're both is, kind of benchmark. Okay. Yeah, this is based upon. Two thousand. Oh shoot. Two thousand nine to two thousand thirteen American Community Survey five year estimate, mm -hmm. which is the most recent information that I could find mm -hmm. as far as median household income. So it's a little newer than even the two thousand ten census. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then it factors in from that sixty thousand seven hundred seven and in inflation increase for salary as well. Well, the way I do it is every time the Census Bureau does an update, I use that information. Mm -hmm. So you know they're going to come out with the two thousand ten to two thousand fourteen information shortly, and then I just use that. Yeah. They always have a five-year estimate that's always dragging behind about a year. Okay. And it, it ends up being kind of a rolling average. And and I will say, too, that Wayne has provided us with these files in, in a way that Melissa will be able to update them and manipulate them as we go. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I guess what I'm getting at is, I mean, if salaries are going to increase as well, maybe these percentages aren't going to be as high, right? That's true. Okay. And I, I made no attempt to try to make that adjustment. Okay. Uh, I simply used the best available statistical data that I had mm -hmm. access to. Uh, I, I do that because that is the way the funding agencies make their review when they're doing an eligibility determination. For that they, they do, that's the numbers they use. Mm -hmm. Sewer history, I, I guess before I go in, any additional questions on water? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -mm. Thank you. Sewer, uh, 
has also been cash negative in three of the past five years. In Ashery, that negative has increased successively for the past three years. And you actually had an operating loss in 2014 of a quarter of a million dollars in suicide. Again, we're starting out behind the ball. We're starting out, out from the deficit position, which makes the percentages and makes the recommendations look a lot worse. Uh, sewer customer mix is slightly different than water. Not much. Excuse me. Recommendations? Yes. If if we're starting in a negative position, mm -hmm. as you're saying, uh, it makes it look like what it is, <laughs> not worse, yeah. because you can't yeah. you can't erase that negative. Am I correct? Well, <laughs> or my the, what I would have had to have recommended as far as a rate wouldn't be as painful if you started out at zero. At zero. But we're not starting and now at zero. So yeah. I'm giving you a much, it, it looks more painful than it probably should be because you, you went, we went too you long. You went too long without budget. doing anything. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sewers, the same thing. I'm assuming a zero love for growth. Uh, the sewer collection system is probably in a little worse situation mm -hmm. than the water distribution you know, because there's a lot more leaks. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of I and I out there. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, half of the sewer wastewater that you're treating is actually surface water. It's clean water, mm -hmm. it's not sewer. So you're paying to treat an awful lot of clean water. Uh, we put together a CMOM plan in 2013. I don't think it ever really got adopted or utilized uh, to any great extent. I mean, they've made some improvements, don't get me wrong. But I think there's an awful lot of those recommendations that never got implemented. Basically, all the ones that came down to have the money yeah. didn't get done. Mm -hmm. uh, strongly encourage you to go back and look at those recommendations. You know, we've updated the dollar amounts, but you know, the best management practices that we talked about in that plan, you know, they're all still out there. Presently, I and I on the wastewater system is manageable only because you spent a great deal of money at the treatment plant, flow equalization, and upsized capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, the issue with uh, collection systems is as they continue to age, they take on yet more water. Mm -hmm. So your your goal on the collection system is to at least stop the deterioration so that you don't end up overflowing the treatment mm -hmm. plant and having to grow something yet bigger. Uh, same process that we talked about on water for sewer for improved preventative maintenance. Uh, a lot of the same recommendations, more of them because the sewer system's in worse shape, and it costs more money. That's about 1.5 FTE, and quite a bit more uh, repairs. It's going to take some, some funding to catch things up, mm -hmm. to improve maintenance, so that you prevent things from getting worse. You should think of preventative maintenance like doing an oil change to your car. It's the best money you can spend. If you don't change the oil, the car won't last very long. And the same thing goes with preventative maintenance on the public infrastructure. If you don't take care of it, it's going to wear out quicker. All of these collection system items were 
discussed in great detail in the CMOM. Mm -hmm. We did update the prices, we did update things because you had some personnel changes. Actually, probably went down just a little bit, but they feel comfortable that they can do what needs to be done with that mm -hmm. amount of money. But you know, all of those need to be referenced back to that CMOM. Any questions there? Uh, predictive maintenance escrow. And uh, the things like pipe uh, renovation, sewer laterals, <coughs> and maybe a private property grant program. The, I throw those out as tidbits or considerations. That's something that probably the board needs to discuss if we want to get involved in doing that. 60% of the I&I &I originates on private property. Mm -hmm. Downspouts, yard drains, footers that were tied into the system 30, 40, 50 years ago when it was totally appropriate to do so not appropriate anymore. It's a huge homeowner expense and a lot of communities are starting to put some money aside to help homeowners with those repairs. They do serve a public good. Mm -hmm. If you can stem the flow at a source, it's usually the cheapest place to enter to, to, to really make progress. Right. You know, the cost of removing downspouts is very, very inexpensive compared to the cost of relining and remanaging. Building a bigger plant. Mm -hmm. uh, the cost of removing sump pumps in your case, because I think there's a lot of sump pumps out there. Well, I think so too. I hear one every time I walk my dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little more expensive for the homeowners. You can give them a carrot, you know, maybe pay 20 to 30 percent of the cost on a reimbursement basis or a cost not to exceed X to take care of this problem. Uh, that avoids you having to do bigger, more expensive things later. I've got a, I put a lot of additional information in the packet that I gave the patty as far as uh, that type of information. And if you were to be interested in that, I'd be more than happy to work with the community on that type of project. Uh, the city of Sydney is doing that for a very significant portion of the city. <coughs> a reference point in addition to some of the information that I put together uh, for a presentation that I did internally for our, as an internal training in our organization. So there are some things in the predictive maintenance that you might want to discuss, not implement primarily. You know, the sewer plant, we've got a nice new plant that right now is able to handle the flows. The, I budgeted in the rate increase in over about four years. It can probably be implemented at a much slower pace if need be. Doesn't necessarily get you off the hook as far as not doing anything, but you're not nearly under the pressure on sewer that you are on water. Right. And once you take a loan, you got to pay it back. And you're at that point, the, the largest driver on the water system is that treatment plant. And there's nothing that can be done about that because you're on schedule there that yeah. you can't, really can't change at this point. There is some opportunities on the sewer side mm -hmm. to not change the, to the total cost, but to change the implementation schedule. 
from a capital improvement project. Uh, those are some of the capital projects that I got from your staff. Uh, also, some things that I picked up from my CMOM report. Uh, the biggest area here, the biggest cost, is really starting to deal with North Sewer Shed. And that's where the majority of your I and I is at. Uh, if you look at the geography of the area, the downtown area lies very close to bedrock, mm -hmm. an impervious layer that holds water at a perched level that allows any defect in the piping to, to, to basically absorb and carry that water away. And if you go out to the west side of town, a lot of that is good flat brooks and soil that in a natural state would have a a water table within about 18 inches of the surface. Uh, it's obviously been well drained, but there's no storm sewers there. So, you know, the drainage is coming through the septic. So that's the reason why the Northwest Station keeps overflowing. And until, until you can continue to build it bigger, but until you remove some of the water at the source, it's going to continue to overflow by So, I, know, I budgeted some money here to work on that north uh, collection system. Mm -hmm. I put it in as a fairly quick project. I'm not under any pressure to do it. Be done. And as a matter of fact, I'd recommend you not do it until you've had enough time to clean the sewers, to monitor flow, and to really understand what needs to be done internally, not by hiring an engineer and you know exposing yourself to that um, amount of abuse, for lack of a better term. But to, to really know what needs to be done in-house so that when you do come up with a project, it is designed to solve the problem because the problem has been well-defined and well-researched. And you contain that uh, project to what really needs to be addressed, what's going to give you the biggest bang for the buck. And that may not happen in three if that takes longer, you can push some of this out a little longer. But in my opinion, it still needs to happen. Uh, eventually, you're going to have the same thing on the south side. It's a lot farther out. It's a lot better condition. And further, but probably more important, it's better soils. The soils are less conducive to pushing water so really on the south side, you know, do some initial inspection of the manholes, uh, which didn't get done the first time, and then fix what's broken and not do much else until it becomes a bigger problem. So factoring all that into a budget, again, I, it was, the cost was driven as far as a typical year that we go to the sewer history and the very clean definitions of how I came up with the typical year there. And I won't go through each line item just to make sure that you know where the numbers came from. But that number was brought over to the sewer budget as a typical year there. And then I started inflating it for inflation, again at three and a half percent. And we added money in for improved preventive maintenance, predictive maintenance, and for capital improvements. We 
go farther down. Those project, the, the capital improvement projects are defined in this table in the year that I scheduled them for, not perhaps the year they're going to occur. But you can see how that would begin to affect debt payments. Again, those factors is basically how I came up with the budget that I made my recommendations off of. Using kind of the same format, same methodology. I did it mostly up front. 15% a year for four years. I, I said you could push that out a little bit depending upon how quickly you do these capital things. You're not going to change the total. It kind of is what it is. Okay. On the sewer side, the stabilization percentage cost cost is about three percent. Mm -hmm. It's a little higher. And the affordability index. Sewer again, it's a little more expensive than water, but still very, very affordable. Right now it's 0.74 percent median household income. At the stabilization rate. That I have it shows year four, it's 1.32 percent. Uh, 1.5 is the oh, again is kind of the threshold of eligibility for most of the funders for low interest loans and grants. Two percent median household income. As long as you're less than that, it's considered affordable. That's where you start to have some resistance. Mm -hmm. Two and a half is basically what I define as. Mm -hmm. There are communities out there with three, three and a half percent median household income for a single utility. Mm -hmm. And this, at least one of those increases wouldn't be there if the rates would have been stabilized before Early. they got started. Yeah. But some of this was going to happen because, yeah. Uh, Patty and yeah. Melissa have copies of the spreadsheet. It's mm -hmm. unprotected. Uh, they can, you guys can make adjustments. If you want to have me make adjustments, I can do by phone and send it back. Mm -hmm. And this will, of course, come into factor um, with the budget talks when we talk about enterprise funds and, mm -hmm. and uh, what needs to happen with the budget for the mm -hmm. enterprise funds, which I think is coming up in uh, uh, about a month or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So, Two so, meetings. Uh, yeah. Well, um, this is a great report. You're a very patient explainer of the complicated <laughs> things, and that's really helpful. Um, I have to say this is the first time I felt like I'm not floundering when it comes to our utilities in terms of just really understanding the finance side. So I want to thank you very much for that. It's not happy news, but you know, it's uh, it's good to feel like we know we know where we stand, and uh, and so I'm very grateful to staff for for bringing you on and. Uh, and we do have uh, Johnny and Brad here. I see um, that. If you have any questions of them, they've they along with Jason, Melissa, and myself uh, have fully participated yes. <laughs> with Wayne. Um, and uh, I think we're all on board as a staff. Of um, we agree, it's not great news, um, but it is. Um, we think a legitimate. There are legitimate conclusions um, that Wayne has reached as far as you know. In, in a perfect world would this have all started a little earlier? Yeah, but there are just a lot of things that need to be taken care of and, and we will take it on to be our responsibility to start working on those things. 
uh, on a regular basis. Um, but the, the rates are the, the first step. Yeah. So do well, either of you? A lot of the stuff as far as improved management can't. Those improved management practices just can't occur until you've got funding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and it's, also, it's also part of why Melissa and I uh, recommended to council that we do reinstitute the capital improvement budget for each of the enterprise funds because then you will see where this is going and that's where the funding will come out of for, for these different projects. Can we talk just for a few minutes about the uh, recommendations about, uh, I guess, it adds up to 2.5 full-time employees? Um, we can. Um, I think that, that while staff would love to have 2.5 more full-time employees, I, I don't think that they're expecting that to happen mm -hmm. um, overnight for, for a couple of reasons. Um, I think one of the big things, if we can get the remote read meters in, mm -hmm. um, I think that is going to be a huge help. Um, to Johnny and his crew. Johnny, would you, I mean, because we're, we're, we're doing the electric meters, um, but if you, we can also do remote read water meters, that will free up two of your employees for a good portion of the time to help. Right. It, will re, it will free up uh, one and a half. Right. Uh, so we could right. probably give a part-time meter reader and then the other employee could go with Full-time with the crew. With the full -time with the water. Mm -hmm. And so that that would that would help there. But you're talking you know, nine hundred thousand for the water, for the electric or for the remote reads. For what? But, for but the, installing the new meters. Installing them and, you know, we have started doing them uh, for so electric. We, for electric and for some of the water uh, and the new meters that we're purchasing. Uh, have the capability so when a new system comes online, we can just add like a 75 hour part and they're fully loads. So as we move forward, we're, we change the meters already and we're just not buying that 75 hour part until we get the system up and running. Okay. So the 900,000, I'm sorry, is for water? That's for water to remote install read. the meters and the meters themselves. Okay. And you've gotten a couple of prices, I think, on that, right? Correct. Okay. It's, it's somewhere between that. Some of it did not work that. Mm -hmm. And so, some do, of them have to come outside the house. Oh, okay. Right. That's part of that's part of the issue is that all of these meters that are inside the houses, when they go to remote read, we need to move them outside the house. Four hundred ninety-eight of them are still inside. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <gasps> that's more and, than I thought. And that creates an additional problem because we can't, can't read, read them. them. Yes. Yeah, regularly, like we're supposed to. The ordinance says that we have to be allowed to read them once I, a year. I take it back. There's 498 of them that are inside without the old remote system. There's 289 of them that are, are inside, inside with that remote. Have the old style remotes that are failing, like daily. Okay. So, yeah. so you get um, over 600. Right, and that so and that work it. of moving that outside while it's at village expense is normally done by a contractor, so that it's warranted for the homeowner. But that's close to half of our households, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It's an amazingly huge problem, yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, we have, what, 1,000 in the pits. 17, 21. Really? So it's about wow. a third. No, I thought it was 13. I guess so. And that's wow. probably mostly in the old part, older part of town. There's it all over. Oh. Really? Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. But I'm, it's... In but my neighborhood, I see where they marked on the... <laughs> yeah. Where they all are. But the that... Yellow, but, yeah, that's... Strip. That's part of what raises that cost so much is that it's moving those outside. We have that done by a contractor because it provides the homeowner with the warranty should something not be done properly, mm -hmm. um, that the homeowner can go back and have that. And that's common practice. I think we wanted to comment on that. Yeah. Having these meters inside the home is a huge responsibility for the community from the standpoint if there is a leak on the service pipe which is the smallest diameter, least resistant to corrosion of any pipe in the system. That leak is both very difficult to detect. One way you want to detect it is if you put a listening device on the meter and on the valve outside. So you have to, to basically leak detect every ladder separately. Mm -hmm. And you're totally responsible for the water loss. Whereas if that meter relocated to the curb stop, 
Oh. And the line is given back, is recognized to the homeowner. If it has a pin leak in it, it becomes the homeowner's responsibility to address the water loss, right. to pay, pay increased bills, or to mm -hmm. upgrade the pipe. Right. Homeowners right. will not upgrade the pipe. <laughs> it doesn't have an economic benefit for them. Right? Yeah. They will only upgrade when right. it breaks completely and so they don't have water anymore. Right. My guesstimate is that a lot of your water loss, maybe all of your water loss, could be <laughs> due to that. Yeah, it's very helpful to hear because the last time we had the conversation about water loss, I don't recall hearing this particular explanation. Mm -hmm. Right, and there's just there's just no way to really tell how much you're losing <laughs> can, that way. There's can, just can, no you, way. can you repeat that again? Uh, can I give you an example? Yeah. yeah. I worked with the community of Murray City, coal mine community on the opposite side of the state, and they I, I came in after the fact, but they had. Got, they've got, they got, they were very, very poor. And they got error money under a shovel ready project, a lot of grant, to completely replace their distribution system. Wow. Hmm. They did not replace the service levels. They put oh, no. the new pipe <laughs> up to the old service levels. Oh, no. A lot of the meters were located in, in houses. As a matter of fact, the majority of What they found is that installing a complete, complete new distribution system reduced water loss from 53 to 47 hmm. percent. Wow! To so get the water loss, they were still losing almost half of the water, and it was almost all coming. And it was almost all. Now they went and basically begged some assistance from Rural Water, who we went in there and uh, installed some used meters at the meter pits. Mm -hmm. And doing that, they reduced the water loss down to 20%. Hmm. So how effective was the major project, error money, shovel ready, that they spent massive yeah, amounts of money. They spent on. a bunch of money. Oh, it's so and sad. And didn't fix the problem. Now, I'm going to say that they didn't get something out of it. The pipe was had a lot of crustacean in it. Mm -hmm. They had restrictions and pressure problems. It's probably a much better system now, but, but the place where the money really needed to be spent. Right. It wasn't where it went. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, the same thing on the sewer private property, if you address, if you remind sewers and don't deal with private property, mm -hmm. uh, I've seen countless numbers of countless relining projects that have really accomplished nothing mm -hmm. because they didn't deal with where the water really came in at. Right. Does that help answer your question, Jerry? Mm, not quite. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's be real simple, okay? And I, I think my meter's in the yard. Okay, mm -hmm. so if my meter was in the house, and I'm I'm the the utility provider, so any loss between uh, mm -hmm. this this where it comes into the street to my house, I as the provider is suffering that loss. The, the utility will be suffering. The village. Let, let me so, correct something that was okay. said. The homeowner is responsible to the curb stop. That's what I thought. Okay. But the water loss before the meter, the utility is responsible. responsible. So, so there, the there could be loss right. running from the curb into right. my house. Okay. But it's and not going to be measured. It's, but that's not measured. Okay. Yeah, well, Except on our end. You call us to say you have lost pressure in your okay. house. Okay. And we go out there and put a leak detector on it, have you shut all your water off, and if there's a water leak or something, we can hear. Okay. What happens is those little pinhole leaks are the size of a pencil lead. 
they really go away. They never come to the surface. They never they yeah. never surround yeah. anything. Right. That they, it's like bleeding to death in a million paper cuts. Right. They're just everywhere. Right. You know, for an individual homeowner, you don't mount too much. It's not causing them a problem because the water doesn't surface. Yeah. But when you add it all together, it becomes a 28% unaccounted for water. Right. Which it's like a, having soaker hoses in the, <laughs> yeah, going to the house. Perfect yeah. analogy. So, so it really be behooves both parties to try to in the long run, in long run to, to correct these yes. these leaks, whether it's in my house or outside. Right. We're losing, I can give you a prime example. Going down limestone when we did the sewer renovation mm -hmm. on limestone, we actually had a one-inch main feeding seven houses down that way, and in one section of the pipe we probably had 50 holes that we had no idea was there. And that's a one-inch line, so you figure five inches, three quarter of one inch is going to be a house surface that's all galvanized. And we find it everywhere. Yeah. Galvanized pipe has a useful life of about 35 years. If it's older than 35 years, I can guarantee it leaks. That's, that's a lot of the houses around right. here. Right, yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Any other uh, questions? I, I guess my, my other, it's mm -hmm. either question or comment. So, from, from a council standpoint, <clears throat> if it, and, and let's take 15 percent increase. Okay. If we only elected to increase rates by 10 percent, then, then that 5 percent goes downhill. Mm -hmm. Which says that if we don't increase the next year by 20 percent, right? Then, and we've then lost that, the year. Of, we lost the year right. plus it yeah. goes downhill it, again. Right. And at some it, point, it just adds the pain. And the there, pain is going to be more than. A lot of people are going to it, the and there is a compounding factor uh, uh, in that too because um, the more you defer the higher the price goes up on what you did defer so that when you finally get to it your cost is higher plus the fact that it is in more shape so it is there is a compounding factor right. in that right mm -hmm. now, if you defer defer smart <coughs> have some logic to what you're doing and how you're doing it do not defer the pre preventative maintenance. Right. Figure out a way to change the oil so that veins are maintained. If you need to to defer predictive maintenance or, or a capital project that's not really scheduled yet, you can't do that with the treatment plan. It's all you really, you really you're stuck in the water. Right. Uh, but on the sewer, you know, if you do it, you decide, well, I don't really know what I'm going to do with that first capital project on mm -hmm. sewer, and I'm not going to do it in year four, I'm going to do it in year seven. Mm -hmm. That, you know, it's still on the budget. It's still, you, all you've done is you've moved a cost to a different location. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, that I'm okay with that. Right. You're just uh, taking a little more time to build up the funds. To, to build up the funds and to build up the case as to what needs to be done. Not making a rash decision. Uh, don't kick it down 15 or 20 years because yeah. that's when you're going to have that compounding effect that's going to end up costing everybody a lot more money. But if you don't do it, you still got to yeah, put something in that fund. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, to me, and Western civilization is built on sewer and clean water, so it's the most important thing. <laughs> and remember that on, you know, you've got about a two hundred thousand dollar annual deficit on both utilities to start with. You can't. You got to. You got to plug that. But then plug it, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So the, those early year uh, increases really are not optional. They yeah. Mm -hmm. Kick the can down the road a little bit in the later years, but that's mm -hmm. your early years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. All right. Well, thank, um, you, Wayne. thank, thank you, Wayne. you very much. We really appreciate your taking the time and uh, the careful, diligent job you do. And 
I assume we'll have follow-up where we get the mm -hmm. sample ordinances or something, because it will take ordinances, right, mm -hmm. for correct. both of yeah, these. Um, and if staff has any ideas about um, how to how to think about some of the options that he put in, okay. obviously we'll want to Absolutely. hear your ideas on that. And maybe we can bring the, uh, since we're having budget talks, uh, we can bring the first, we can bring a draft of the ordinance to the next uh, mm -hmm. meeting. That seems reasonable. Yep. Right. Good. Um, anybody, I know we've got one citizen in the corner. I want to make sure that uh, that uh, nobody wants to speak. Paul? Oh. No. Okay. Wayne, it was good to work with you again. Mm -hmm. haven't, haven't seen you for a while, so it's good to work with you. Yeah. Oh, call me if there's anything else we can do. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate it. I really do. I appreciate your... And if you have questions on this, it, you know, I'll be more than happy to answer those. But I don't know Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Wayne. Okay. So we are now moving to the next item on our tiny agenda, which is the manager and assistant man village manager reports. Um, <laughs> so that we can let um, Brad and Johnny go. Absolutely. Um, would you guys take that box out of my office to Jerry's car, please? This will get you in the door, and I think uh, the box is sitting next to the file cabinet, I think. All, all you got to do is just touch the handle. Thank you. And then, then hit the lock. Um, okay, council has my report in your packet. Um, most of it is just informational. If there's anything you want to ask about, um, a couple of special announcements. The first one is that dispatcher Teresa Newsom is retiring. Uh, as everyone knows, and her send-off will be this Thursday afternoon uh, at 2.30 in rooms A and B. And anyone who wants to wish Teresa well uh, is welcome to attend. Uh, it's Thursday, uh, September 24th. It's this Thursday at 2.30 in rooms A, B. Um, the second thing is, again, good news. We have been informed that we are actually getting a 1% decrease in our medical um, benefits package uh, costs that we provide to uh, to the um, employees that's because our demographics are, are so good um, and we have these younger healthier people um, huh. and really good news is the new website is slated to go live on Wednesday not good um, and so everybody please bear with us um, there will not be a hundred percent of all the information up there but once we get it going we'll be updating it and changing it and and uh, putting up notices and the staff is learning to do that and eventually we'll be teaching council how to do that for your commissions yes so um and so we do we will have all the commission pages uh, we, yeah, we, yeah, we've okay. asked them to, to make sure that's in there. Um, and one thing that is not in the packet that I, I forgot to put in there, we've, we've started having questions about uh, when Beggar's Night is going to be. Mm -hmm. And Beggar's Night um, will be on the 31st from 6 to 8. Um, that is just for general information, a recommendation that most um, city county management associations make is that it always be on the 31st from six to eight so that everybody has it at the same time and it's it's that's been the practice and if it is in fact my decision to make um which i believe it is i mean you can correct me if i'm wrong but um if it is my decision to make it will always be on the 31st from six to eight mm -hmm. um, because that's just the it's a best practice i agree so um, other than that, Hope if you have any there. other questions, everything else in my report you can read. Can we just highlight the uh, Utility Dispute Resolution Board? Oh, yes. Thank you, Brian. Um, we are taking applications for the Utility Dispute Resolution Board. I don't believe we've gotten any um, to date. Um, none of the three of us have received any. And that is, the deadline is coming up um, this week, I believe. Yeah, you said September 25th? uh yeah i think Friday. that's the day we may need to when we were having trouble with uh trying to get people for planning commission we started 
call in people and yeah. so mm -hmm. yeah. council people may want to think about yeah. who, I, or if anybody yeah. here has ideas of people who might be good <laughs> yeah I did have I did have care a couple, about the issue and want to yeah I did, serve in that way I did have a couple people who had asked me about it and uh, I sent word to one of those people the other day that um, hey by the way you said right. you thought might you th might want to serve on this um, but um, if you know anyone, it might not be a bad idea to get in touch with them because by ordinance we need to have it and it needs to have two citizens on it, um, or three mm -hmm. citizens, th two citizens. I think it's two. 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 You, me, Johnny, and two citizens. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So um, if, anyone, if anyone is interested, please apply. Mm -hmm. And I also just wanted to, because I know Jerry and Mary Ann were going to interview the applicants. And I just wanted to highlight uh, the roles and responsibilities statement that that should always be a part of the interviews now that we have that. Um, and I guess, you know, just on that, I also wanted to mention Economic Sustainability Commission. We are also still uh, looking for folks. Right. I, I think, Judy, we've gotten one person so far. Two. Two. Excellent. Yeah. Um, the Utility Dispute Resolution Board will be an as needed meeting. It's not going to be a regularly scheduled meeting, it will only be if someone disputes you know a, a utility charge of some kind so it won't be a regular meeting and, and I would assume maybe two or three times a year at most um, for that meeting mm -hmm. so it's not a huge time commitment and um, it, it is an important it is an important board so. okay that's all did, I have. did you want to update on the electrical outage at all so oh, the electrical services. outage. Um, apparently a semi hit a telephone pole um, that ended up on top of the semi later oh, this oh. evening. Oh. And uh, so that was why we had the electrical outage up in the area of Cemetery Street. Um, the new Actually, pole. was that Cemetery Street, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Not that, Cemetery, the... Yeah. The, it was Street. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so that's, uh, I think, probably why Johnny was late. Yeah. Um, because when I was uh, coming back about 3.30, uh, 3.15, uh, he was headed up there to take care of that. So that was probably why he was late. I don't know how he happened to turn down there. I don't know either, but um, I've seen... He must have been lost. Yeah, I That's see. something I've seen. I don't yeah, know. I, I, you can't go anywhere. That role. You can't yeah. go anywhere. I saw yeah. half a but half a bridge. house going through the middle of town today at rush hour. So I was oh, yeah. really interested <laughs> in whether he was going to get it through there without hitting anybody, but he oh. did. So, um, but yes, that is uh, why we had the outage, and uh, it has been corrected. So. Okay, Melissa, do you have anything to add to your report? Um, nothing really to add. Um, I just wanted to highlight the smart bill and uh, online billing and bill pay. It's, it's been fairly well received. Um, we've had 213 people that have set up accounts and of those 111 have elected to have their bills delivered via email. Now that doesn't give us good numbers on how many bills have been reduced in mailings because some customers get one more than one bill. Yeah. Um, so. I'm, I'm going to be kind of watching to see how that trends in the coming months, but it's definitely catching on and although we did have um, some customers complain about the fees, last month we brought in $8,000 worth of um, online utility bill pay um, money, so that's pretty good and we're on track to repeat that again this month. So it's, it's, it's working out very well, um, the bills are going out much faster, the turnaround is like 48 hours between the time we get them give them to the bill company and they print them and they actually hit the mail. Um, before we were figuring in like five days mm -hmm. and um, the, the it was being blamed on the, the United States Postal Service and it's not the case at all, like the turnaround has been really quick so we're really excited about that. So, huh. um, And also for anybody that was concerned about the fees, we do still accept um, credit cards through the window for free. Um, if you mail them in, that's for free, and also um, over the phone, so person, phone, and in the mail. But we are looking, though, um, at that again, just because with the EMV chips, which everybody's probably noticed that they've started to get new credit card and debit cards in the mail, they've all got a chip on them. and this card actually needs to be put inside of a machine by the customer and it reduces the liability on the 
um, company or organization accepting payment in case there is a fraudulent charge. Right now, the current practice is that if uh, if we were to take in a card and it was stolen, mm -hmm. um, that would be on the credit card company to figure out and they would bear the burden. But now with this new technology, if we were to accept a card that was stolen and we don't have the new reader in it, the customer is not the one physically putting that in and we have to process it ourselves it opens up liability for us. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at getting the new card reader and um, through our current card provider that we have um, down in the office, it's gonna be like $600. So I'm mm -hmm. looking at different options for that, but we have a couple of weeks before that starts. So. And how would that affect people who want to pay over the phone or pay if they wanna write their credit card number on the bill and send it in? You're not going to physically have the cards. So no. How is that going to affect that? That's something that I'm working out with the bank okay. to try to figure out, you know, if it's something that's handwritten on the bill and sent through the mail and processed off-site like ours are. I mean, lots of companies do that and offer that. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly how that could affect anything. So I'm, I'm in the process of working on that. So we've got a little I bit mean, of time. I think we will want to institute fees on credit cards because we are paying the fees. And that means people who are not paying credit cards are subsidizing the people who are paying credit cards. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we're going to have to do that. It's not an urgent or emergency situation, mm -hmm. but I think it's got to happen. And that, that's several hundred a month, right? Melissa? It's about $600 a month that we pay in credit card fees, but we've only been accepting credit cards since, uh, I mean, it's only been a couple of months, I mean, maybe eight months now. And we weren't really sure how much it was going to be used. And now that we've been doing it for quite a while and we know how many people are using it, I mean, it is a pretty hefty monthly fee that we have to pay. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's doubled our bank fees, almost tripled them. So, mm -hmm. right. Okay. okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, any, let's see, I guess we have... Um, these standing reports, since so many people are gone, I'm wondering if it would make sense to do the standing reports mm -hmm. in, at the beginning of next month, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. We, um, can, uh, we can, unless somebody's got anything urgent to report on their commissions. Yeah, I think the main thing I wanted to make sure is we, you know, highlighted the commissions that we're trying to fill, but uh, I can wait. Okay. Well, we can just make sure that people are aware. Which which commissions are we trying to fill? So the Economic Sustainability Commission and yes. the Utility Dispute Resolution Board. I had two people contact me about Economic Sustainability. Excellent. So. Great. Okay. More would be welcome. All right. Well, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Okay. So. Wait a minute. Oh wait. Do you, do you want to do future agenda items, or you? Uh, you, you just you did look at the yeah. um, October 29th or possibly 28th uh, right. change for the task force. Well, discussion. until Is there anything else you need to. Uh, I don't think so. I think it's just the that one, okay. and we won't know that one for sure until um, Karen is contacted to see if she can make that time. Yes. Okay. All right. So moved. Second. All those in favor. Aye. 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 All right, meeting adjourned.